Hi, I'm Meredith Bell, President of Performance Support Systems, and I'm very excited today to have with me Libby Gill. And Libby and I first met on LinkedIn. That's been a couple of years ago now, right, Libby? And we became friends instantly due to our passion for developing strong leaders and also our desire to make a positive impact on the world. So we've become really great friends since then. And Libby has a very interesting corporate background. For nearly 20 years, she held senior leadership positions in some of the media giants like Universal, Sony, and Turner Broadcasting. And she was really some of the magic behind the Dr. Phil show. So um, she did uh, that kind of work for many years. And then in 2000, I think it was, right, Libby, you decided to start your own company called uh, Libby Gill uh, and Company. And <clears throat> Libby's the author of two previous books that I've read, and they're both excellent. And today I'm going to be interviewing her about her newest book, which is called The Hope Driven Leader. I love that title. And the subtitle is Harness the Power of Positivity at Work. Thank you for showing that. Um, and I have lots of questions for Libby about her book that I want to bring out for our listeners. So Libby, let's go ahead and get started. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here, Meredith. Thank you. And first, I want to just ask you to spend a few minutes talking about your experiences, the work you've done over the years, so we understand better how you came up with the material that's in your new book. Sure. Well, I, I had sort of a rocky childhood, which I talk about in another one of my books called Traveling Hopefully. And, and for me, the, I was always looking for that, that willpower, that desire to get out of bed, get moving, get excited about life. And I discovered the, uh, the human potential and self-development literature as a, as a teen. Uh, it was not, not something that my family was too into. And I remember like sneaking books into my bedroom and hiding them under the bed so no one would see what I was reading. But I've always considered hope the jet fuel for the, the, the journey of work and life and this, this sort of powerful inner drive that gets you through tough times, that moves you towards a vision. And after that first career in television where I started executive coaching and I started a business, I was in my mid-40s starting my first business from scratch, really kind of without a clue of what it meant to be an entrepreneur. But I really began to study hope in, in earnest and discovered the body of science called hope theory that comes from medicine and positive psychology. And with the clientele I was working with, people that were under stress, that were really challenged by their leadership, sometimes they were stuck, other times they were people that were just meet, dealing with this ongoing massive change, hope seemed to me the missing ingredient for so many leaders and also cultures. Hmm. And when I think about it, because you and I have both read lots and lots of books on leadership <clears throat> over the years, what did you feel was missing from those other books around this specific topic of hope? To me, it was about who you are as a human being and which pieces of that, of your character, that you bring to work. Because early on in my career in entertainment, when I first hit that first rung of leadership, I remember a very senior woman, probably the most senior I knew in television, who said to me, oh, you're just too nice for this business. And it wasn't a compliment, which I was well aware of. And I thought, you know, I don't see leadership and, and, and being mean as a, you know, a necessary pairing. I think you can be nice, and that's a very soft word in itself. But what I discovered is there are all these different types of leaders, some who, who really do well in terms of directing their team because they are, uh, because they demand it. They demand the results and the outcomes. And sometimes they happen in spite of the leaders, not because of them. And there were other leaders who could inject a sense of of positiveness, of graciousness, and of hopefulness into their cultures. And I saw, and for me, that worked much better, uh, but I saw people who could inspire others by their own behavior. And that was the kind of leader I wanted to be. And as I began coaching, I really dug deep into what that meant, and I discovered hope theory which is really comprised a couple of the, the pioneers that come out of medical and, and positive psychology 
really looked at hope theory as having a future focused vision, the, the reality, understanding the reality of the situation and knowing that there would be challenges and setbacks, that those were simply part of the process and having the willpower and the stamina and seeing that there were multiple pathways to the end result. So all of those things in combination, they called true hope as opposed to that sense of false hope, oh, everything's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. and, we, and so see those clients who think, oh, it's all going to work out. And, you know, not so much if you're not really paying attention. So it, it sort of put that old saying, hope is not a strategy on its ear, where I thought, well, you can give all the strategies you want, but if your workforce is feeling hopeless, they're not going to take them in. They're not going to embrace them. And that was really, to me, what was missing from the literature. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you, <clears throat> you did such a great job of addressing um, the theory part without getting bogged down, you know, in the theoretical and the conceptual. And so much of your book then is very practical. And one of my very favorite chapters, it probably is my favorite chapter three, where you talk about servant leadership, because I'm such a fan of that, a way of being as a leader. And you made the point that servant leaders are the actual shapers of the hope-driven culture, and I like that term. So I'd love to hear more about your definition of servant leader and why you believe they are the ones that have to be behind this, developing this kind of culture. Right, and sometimes there are, there are leaders who, I, I, they probably either don't know the term servant leadership or would never apply that to themselves, but we know them immediately when we see them. Mm -hmm. They are the leaders who feel like, uh, I'm, I work for my team, they don't work for me. It's the mm -hmm. other way around. They're there to develop and build the next generation of talent. And they feel not only is that their obligation, but it's their privilege to be able to bring people up that pipeline. And companies that don't see that and don't embrace that, or leaders, I'm working with a leader now who does not see the relevance of that. And you know that really can, can uh, really mess with your succession planning if you're not building that bench strength. But one group that, that I worked with and I, I felt so privileged to be around them was a group at um, Abbott Medical. It's a medical device company. And I worked with their Midwestern sales team and did a day-long strategy session, which was just terrific. They were giving and open and honest and critical in a very positive way. And then what they did afterwards to me was just the best example of servant leadership because they decided this was about, about 60 people. And then they had another 100 people that were a little bit more junior and they had an awards banquet for them. And I've been to a lot of those kinds of award things for salespeople and that sort of thing. But they wanted to surprise their team with something they thought would be really fun, which happened to be a harbor cruise around Lake Michigan. We were in Chicago. But what the team didn't know, they, it was a surprise to them. They knew they were going out. They didn't know where. So they boarded this beautiful yacht, and they saw their supervisors, the team leaders, the head of sales and his regional directors, standing at the top of the gangplank, holding up these trays of wine and champagne dressed as waiters. So they, and, and they were, it was the real thing. They really waited on their staff through the whole cocktail hour, on into dinner, into the awards banquet, and the people that won signed their jackets. <laughs> it was very cute. I'm sure they were rentals, but not after that night. But they wanted to, they really wanted to embrace their team by saying, you know, and they had fun with it. It wasn't that they were just servant leaders, but they were server leaders serving the team. And to them, it was a way of saying, thank you. We appreciate you. And it didn't cost anything except a couple of jackets. It was clever. It was uh, funny. It was the most creative expression. So it just proved to me that you can recognize and reward your team without doing anything too fancy. It can be as simple as, you know, muffins or bagels on a Friday morning or a, a group, you know, team event or you're you know, an offsite that really recognizes people in a unique way. And, and that's exactly what the folks at Abbott did. And then they let, I told the story, I wrote a blog post about it, and they loved it. And I said, well, how about if I include it in my book? And they loved that. So they wanted to share the story. They are all about feeding hope and building that into their team. Well, you know, as I listened to you tell the story, I was imagining if they didn't live the servant leadership 
life regularly throughout every day. That kind of event and gesture would fall flat. Absolutely. Wouldn't have the same impact at all. People are so cynical that if you don't, you know, if you have a manager who's, who is not a servant leader, who doesn't understand the things we're talking about, you know, they come in and they say something nice. Everybody's like, huh, I wonder what seminar he went to or what book he read. But these, they were the real deal. And people knew that. They knew that it was, it was authentic. It was legitimate, that they really meant it. And it was so well received. People just, they just were so pleased. And they felt so honored by their own bosses. And it was, it was really a great gesture. Yeah, what it's making me think of is when we hear about servant leaders, and if someone wants to be more like that, it's really a way of being, how you show up every day. It's not a technique that you apply. <laughs> and that, to me, is really what you're getting at to me through the whole book, was a way of being as a hopeful leader and what you can do to instill that in the people who are in your realm of influence. Um, and so one of the other um, chapters, um, t you talked about these five critical factors that are needed for a team to be successful, and that really struck me. And so I'd like you to get real specific here and give examples of how our listeners could incorporate those five critical factors within their own teams. Sure. In the book, I, ta I, I found some incredible research that sort of separated the, the, the facts and the fiction about teamwork. And what I found is it's really about having this high level of engagement, that's everybody speaking, a level of energy, and then exploration. So the five things that people can do, and, and the book is really about belief driving behavior. Concepts are great, but action trumps concepts all the way. So the first thing is that team members talk and listen in approximately the same amount. So it's not one person talking and everybody else listening. Everybody's got a part in the conversation. And they're, they're succinct, they're straightforward, they say what they're gonna say, stop talking, let somebody else have a turn. Second, team members face each other. And even in, in video conferencing, like we're doing now, they face each other, their discussions and their, and their gestures are lively, they're energetic, there's a level of enthusiasm. They're talking to people. They're not just talking at or just having their voice heard. They're having a dialogue. Um, the members connect with one another, not just the leader or not just the loudest voice in the room, but there's a distribution across the group. Um, the fourth thing is that members carry on. Now, this is a funny one because we often hear one meeting or everybody be quiet. Let's just have one meeting here. But in fact, side conversations or comments, even a little back channel discussion within the team can be really important. That's a sign that people are thinking, that they're sharing, that they've got ideas. Now, you don't want a whole room of disruptors because you can't get anything done. But if somebody, if I lean in and said, hey, Meredith, let's talk about that offline because it's really important to our work. That's what you want to inspire in a team meeting as opposed to shut down. And finally, and this is a critical balance because it's difficult to be a, an active member of a team and also have those relationships outside the team, but the most effective team members meet with their team, they go exploring outside the team, and they bring back that information, data, best practices, new skills, ideas to their immediate team. So it's the idea that I'm here, I'm with you all, but yesterday, when I was with this other business unit, here's what I learned. It's important for us, and here's why. So when you think about those elements, you can, you can, level, you can take the, the interaction and the contributions and thus the productivity so much further within a team setting. Mm -hmm. Those are so great, and you go into those in more depth. So again, this is just a sampling of what people can learn from you in your book. So I want to encourage folks to get a copy of it. it it'll be a handy reference for you uh, because it's such a good book. You know, the hope is the focus, but just leadership in general. There's so much you, you say about communication and communication skills and the little things people can do that 
make such a huge difference. Um, you also had a chapter that I thought was so cool about helping leaders identify their unique superpowers. And you talked in particular about this Gallup poll where respondents were asked to list three words that described a specific leader that they had worked with. And I thought that was amazing what, um, what, what came out of that. And it was in specific about a leader who had had made a contribution to their life. So obviously a positive impact, not some of the worst ones, but the best leader. And there were um, four attributes that came up most often. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about each of those, because I think, again, our listeners can get an idea of what are the things my people would value in me because they're universal. Well, that was so important to me because so many leaders are well aware of what the organization wants, oh. you know, strategies, setting that vision, monitoring results, bottom line, you know, all of those things. They know that. They're wired to do those things. But they don't always think about it from the other direction of what their followers want and need from them. And when you put on that hat and think about, wow, what, what do I need to do for my team? It can really change the way you lead. And after a review of, of lots of Gallup polls the, the, and the literature about leadership, what about 10,000 responders came up with the four attributes they most want from their leaders are stability, which can be difficult when teams are going through change, but they need their leader to be that rock. Even if it's to say, hey, we're going through change, we've got a few more months of this, they wanna know as much as they can about what's going on. Second was trust. And to me, it's one of those hard to do, but sim simple to describe, but not always so simple to act upon. But to me, it's really about you do what you say you're going to do, and you don't do what you say you're not going to do. And if you don't have trust, you might as well forget it right there, because you've got to have a trusting workplace. Next is compassion, which is simply treating people like human beings. So of course, you have to know their strengths and their abilities, but do you know what they're passionate about in their personal lives? Do you know who their kids are? Do you know, not that you have to know everything about two or 300 people, but your immediate team, you gotta know them as humans. You gotta know what they care about and what drives them and what triggers fear or insecurity. That's really how you build that sense of compassion. And that's a two-way street. You give that, you get that. And then finally, the last, and this really confirmed everything for me, was hope. It's about having a, sense of the future, a direction, and being aligned in this sort of hopeful sense of this future-focused vision that we're all marching towards together. And those are the four things that, that followers really want from their leaders. And, and often when I speak to groups, I'll point those out and ask people, you know, how are you going to attack each one of those? What can you do to increase the trust, to confirm some stability, um, to, to build that compassion and to give people a real sense of hope about their future and the future of the organization. You know, I, I just love those four. And as you were talking, I was thinking, sometimes people struggle. How do I do this? And they don't consider that if they just simply go ask the people who work with them, they'll tell them. <laughs> we're sometimes afraid of hearing the truth and um, afraid of what we'll hear when in fact we can get such awesome information that exactly tells us what people are wanting and needing from us and we get so busy in the course of doing the work that we don't pause slow down and ask simple questions like that so I think um, it would be fascinating if someone took just that one idea to, to go and sit, you know, and, and talk to people about what does trust mean to you? What does hope mean to you? And, and especially in the context of my role as your leader, you know, what, so they get, because people will be very specific about what they want. And if they have trouble articulating it, that's where to me the listening skills, those communication skills come in, where you pick up on what they're saying and not saying and ask more questions. 
It, it, you're right. It's again, it's, it's common sense. It's just not common practice. I wouldn't have a coaching practice if people were straightforward and honest and gave ongoing feedback. And, and, you know, we're sort of conditioned that what you hear might be really uh, scary or unkind or that you can't do anything about it. And people don't want to hear the truth. But in fact, the more information you have, and when it comes from a leader who is truly a genuine Loving, and I mean that, you, you can love the people that you, you work with, whether you're best friends in your social life or not. If you have a level of caring and compassion about them, they will tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that, that takes time. That takes one-on-one uh, -on -one time to invest in that specific person. Well, <clears throat> there's so much in your book. I, I just want to give you a chance now to talk about the key takeaways that you're hoping hoping readers gain from the book. In other words, what impact would you like to have in the way leaders lead others? Um, I would really like for us to have more compassionate workplaces where people want to be rather than have to be. And sometimes just a few simple tweaks, and it's not all the bells and whistles of your free coffee bar and this and that, that's all nice. But that's not what gets people to come work for your organization. Free food is good. People that feed hope and a sense of development, and we're going to help you on your career path, that's what people are craving. They want that sense of purpose, and they want to feel that they, no matter what their level in the organization, that they are connected to the end result. They want to feel like, I'm not just a cog in the corporate machine, I'm not a drone, but what I do, even if it's packing boxes in the warehouse, this, you know, this wouldn't get to you if I weren't in that warehouse packing books and shipping them out. That's an important end result. And when people feel that sense of connection, they, they, they want to be in the workplace. They want to share that sense of, of positive energy with each other. It truly is contagious. And also another thing is that this idea of hope is not passive. This isn't just a concept. And that's one reason I've got at the end of every chapter, I've got a hopeful belief and a hopeful behavior, because it's about behavior and beliefs linked together. And there's an old quote, if you, you want to know what you believe in, look at your check stub. Not that we have check stubs anymore, but you get that you look at your calendar, look at where you spend your energy, and that'll tell you what you believe. If you want to change that, you have to really look at, do I want to be more compassionate? Do I want to be more giving to my team? Do I want to be a better listener? Do I want to be a better communicator? Just like you said, find out how you need to build your, yourself as a leader and then start instilling that in your own team. So I wanted to make sure people get that there, there's an action component to this. Yes, and thank you for bringing that up because I had meant to mention that and I overlooked it. The end of each chapter really is great that way uh, in terms of getting very specific. And I liked the way you broke it between the belief and the action, because I think both are critical for the overall result that you're trying to get. Um, are there any other tips that you feel people listening might benefit from? Well, a couple of things that I'll, I'll let readers find in the book. Um, but one is a chapter for women that's, that's beyond bias. It's how do we get past that? Because the data bears out all the things that um, we're talking about. And in terms of, of what women believe and how they feel and how they're not advancing at the same level as men. And certainly we've seen the Time's Up and the Me Too movement and all of this is sort of coming to a crescendo. But I've got some specific strategies that, that women can employ to advance and help others. It's, it's about creating what I call the lift as you climb culture and take people with you on that journey. And then another section that I found really personally really intriguing, really life-changing to me was the what I call the habit formulation formula, because we've all been told for so long that habits form in 21 days, that that's the typical amount of time. Turns out that's false, and I'll tell you, tell you in the book where that idea came from, what the truth is, and also four simple steps for building a habit that gets to the point of automaticity, meaning you do it without thinking about it. Uh, like buckling your seatbelt when you get in the car, which wasn't a habit when I was a kid. We saw that habit form over our lives. But getting to that point where you just do these things that are good for you and good for others without taking up too much brain space, that's a beautiful way to live. 
Absolutely. Oh, those are great points. And there's so much more in the book. You have um, a chapter also um, on mental illness, you know, the disabilities, the um, challenges, uh, people who are challenged and how to bring hope in those situations too. So it's really, to me, I like the holistic approach because it's geared to the workplace, but then you break it down into other components that are all that we all deal with in uh, at work and also in our personal lives with relatives and friends who are impacted by a lack of hope. And so I think what you give as tips and ideas really have universal application to all aspects of our lives. And to me, the whole book was very uplifting. And I think that was one of your purposes with it is to really instill hope in the reader and in the way they live and show up and behave uh, in their lives. So I want to thank you for your contribution, I think, to the literature in this area. It's a wonderful, um, really uh, insightful book in so many ways. So what I want to do now is ask you to share how can people uh, connect with you, find you, and get a copy of the book. Well. Of course, they can email me directly. I love to answer questions. If somebody shoots me an email and says, I saw you on Meredith's video cast, happy to um, chat with them. They can go to my website, which is libbyguild.com and download the first chapter just for free. I can also order the book there or Amazon or wherever you buy books. And it's, uh, it'll be out very shortly. So um, I'm excited about it. And thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to me. Oh, well, let me thank you so much for being a guest. And I want to also reinforce those of you that are looking for someone to be a coach. Uh, Libby is phenomenal. She just um, has such skills and talents from her own work in the corporate world and just as a human being. You're, you're just one of my favorite people. And I'm so delighted to have had you here with me today. And um, I can't wait to see what comes out in your next book. <laughs> yeah, thank, you, thank you. And for now, go grab your copy of The Hope Driven Leader. Thank you, Libby.